Recording. All right. Thank you, Madam Secretary. So um, the time is six o'clock on February 24th, 2021. And I would like to call the special joint meeting of the Planning Commission and the Housing Advisory Commission to order. So this is my gavel. Uh, in the interest of public health and safety and pursuant to the governor's executive order, N2920, members of the Planning Commission and Housing Advisory Commission and staff are participating in this meeting by teleconference in accordance with the executive order. The public may view this meeting online, but not in council chambers. The city launched a virtual committing, uh, commenting portal called eComment that allows residents to comment and participate in a meeting from their own homes. You can find the link to eComment at www.chillavistaca.gov slash virtual meetings. Your comments must be received before I call uh, for the close of the commenting period in order to be considered. After the commenting period is closed, I will announce a brief pause to allow the commissioners time to read any comments that have been received. If you have difficulty or need assistance with e-comment during the meeting, please email our Madam Secretary, Patricia Salvacion at p-s-a-l-v-a-c-i-o-n at chillavistaca.gov and staff will assist you. Will the secretary please call uh, the, the meeting to order? Yes, I will now call the roll for the Planning Commission. Commissioner Burroughs? Present. Commissioner De La Rosa? Present. Commissioner Milburn? Present. Commissioner Torres? Present. Commissioner Zaker? Present. Chair Gutierrez? Present. And Commissioner Nava has requested an excused absence. We will now call the roll for the Housing Advisory Commission. Commissioner Bustamante? Present. Commissioner Cabral? Present. Commissioner Hoyos? Commissioner Lizama? Present. Commissioner Merino? Commissioner Paddock? And Chair Quero. Present. Secretary Rodriguez? Yes. Commissioner Paddock is on the line as an attendee. If we could switch him over to participant, please. Thank you. Claudia, can you please do that for us? Will do. Thank you. Chair uh, Gutierrez, we can continue to the first item, please. Item number one. Perfect. The first item, uh, first item of the agenda is item number one, which is MPA 21 0001. Consideration of the draft housing element update of the general plan for the 2021 to 2029 planning period. This will, uh, presentation will be done by Leilani Hines, who's our housing manager, and Scott Donahue, the principal planner. Does staff have a presentation? We do. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Gutierrez and commissioners, both housing and planning commissioners. Uh, my name is Scott Donahue, and I'm a principal planner in the Development Services Department. Um, as, as Chair Gutierrez also said, I'll be presenting with Leilani Hines, who's the city's housing manager. Um, before I get started, I want to take a minute and thank all of the staff that have worked tirelessly on getting this draft housing element together for your consideration tonight. Um, we had enormous amounts of staff from both housing planning, city attorney's office, we had everybody involved in this in one way or another. So the housing element is one of the required elements of the general plan, and it has to be updated every eight years. Chula Vista, like every other city in the San Diego County, is in the midst of adopting our housing element for the period beginning April 2000 sorry, 2021 through 2029. This is known as the sixth cycle of the housing element. Do we have a presentation on? Thanks, Dickie. You could go to the second slide. So the state legislature and the governor believe that California's lack of housing and the crisis we are in today 
is due in part to actions of local governments to limit the approval of housing, increase the cost of land for affordable housing, and require that high fees and exactions be paid for by producers of potential affordable housing. In response, and as declared in the new laws, housing is a statewide concern and no longer a municipal affair. As a result, in 2017, we saw 15 pieces of housing legislation passed. In 2018, it was up to 19 new laws. In 2019, it was 20 plus. And in 2020 and 21, it was a little bit slower due to the current public health crisis, but it's also more critical than ever because of the financial impact. These laws are aimed at increasing and preserving the housing supply, strengthening planning and production, uh, streamlining and reducing barriers, and then strengthening enforcement and accountability for local jurisdictions. While there are a lot of these um, laws, there are also some carrots to try to help these happen. Um, so we've seen some funding and available availability of excess state property. Next slide, please. At the center of these new housing laws that have been passed in the housing element and what we term the Regional Housing Needs Assessment or RENA, which is really how many new housing units by income category each jurisdiction must plan for and ensure that there is enough land available in the city for these new housing units. Under state law, the housing element is a required component of a city's general plan. The housing element outlines the city's goals, policies, and programs that will guide future housing growth. This is quantified by its share of anticipated growth arena, and it addresses unmet housing needs of the community based upon its demographics. It needs to do all of this within the context of recent housing laws that have been passed. RENA has become the most controversial aspect of the sixth cycle and will change city planning from here forward. It is at the heart of the public dialogue and is driving a new way of planning for housing. Next slide, please. So before we look forward, we wanna provide a quick analysis of what this, how the city did over the fifth cycle. For the last housing element, which was 2013 through 2021, Chula Vista's share of new housing units was 12,861 homes. Overall, Chula Vista, like many other cities, didn't build enough housing to meet this target. We fell short in all categories with the exception of above moderate income price housing. These are housing that are for families making over $111,000 a year. Because of these shortfalls and the disconnect between planning and building, we have new legislation that tries to bridge that gap with requirements such as no net loss, which Leilani will get into later. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk about the sixth cycle and, and where we are in that. The first step in the update process began with Sandag and the state determining the anticipated growth for the San Diego region over the planning period and how each of the 18 jurisdictions would take its fair share of this growth, also known as RENA. The expected new housing units for San Diego County must plan for is 171,684 units total. This number is further broken down into income categories, which is where both state law and public discussions are focused on as all cities will be required to show that they have sufficient land capacity available to develop these units by each of the income categories at all times during the planning period. Of the total units for the region, which we, I'm gonna go through a, a bunch of numbers. So if you want me to clarify any of them later, I'd be happy to. So of the total housing units for the region, 171,684, 65% of those were allocated to jurisdictions with access to transit. This includes rail stations, rapid bus stations, and major transit stops. This promotes providing these housing units near transit within the region. 35% of those units were allocated to jurisdictions based on the number of jobs in their jurisdiction. These numbers are reflected in the top right corner of your screen. Um, a good example of the jobs weight uh, is the city of Coronado. Sandag counted the jobs from the naval, bear, naval base, which increased the number of housing units Coronado will need to provide in the sixth housing cycle of Reno. Now there's also a further component in the form of an equity adjustment. Existing units were calculated at the four income categories for each jurisdiction and then averaged. The percentages found on the right hand side of the screen were determined by Sandag for the entire region. Those are the numbers that are 16%, 25%, 17%, et cetera. Um, for example, and, and an example of this equity is the city of Del Mar currently has 4% of its housing units in the very low income category. The equity adjustment means that they were allocated more units in those categories to bring them up to the 16% level. Chula Vista at the end of the day has 6.5% of the housing units allocated from the region's needs with 11,105 new housing units 
41% of those units must be for lower income households, which is comprised of very low and low income categories. In comparison, the city of San Diego, given their access to transit and jobs, has 63% of the housing unit allocation at 107 new housing units. Next cycle, please. So in addition, to, in addition to just identifying potential sites, like in past housing elements, the state also threw in some new requirements for identifying sites. For instance, only sites between a tenth of an acre and 10 acres can be counted. Only sites that were zoned to allow 30 units to the acre or more could be counted towards meeting your requirements for low income units. But most importantly for the city of Chula Vista, if a site was identified in both the fourth and fifth cycles, but still had not been developed or redeveloped, you could not identify it again unless the city commits to rezoning these parcels to allow by right affordable housing on those sites. This put the city in an interesting place as we had identified all of the remaining villages in eastern Chula Vista in at least one previous cycle, if not two. That meant that approximately 15,000 plus units could not be counted unless the city committed to allow by right affordable development on them. Next slide, please. So in order to meet our allocation, the city set a goal of how we would identify sites. We set ourselves a goal, which was to meet the allocation numbers as closely as possible. And to meet the goal, we established some guidelines. For instance, we didn't want to count units if development wasn't likely to occur within the sixth cycle. This excluded villages such as Village 9 and Village 10, as well as the city's University Innovation District project. We wanted to make sure that we included all sites and yields that were only in the fifth housing element, meaning they were only in one past version of it. And since they'd already been identified, we felt like we were good moving forward with those sites. We looked to the spa plans in the east um, and we looked for sites that were over 30 units to the acres and brought those down to exactly 30. So we had a number of sites that are in the 40s or even 50 units per acre. We reduced the, the yield or the expected yield on those to 30. And that was to hopefully limit the number of no net loss findings in the future. We included projects that were recently approved, uh, such as Meta and Village 8 West, the Anita Street Apartments and Bonita Glen. And then we balanced our lower income units on the transit focus area sites. These are typically the E Street, H Street and Palomar Street trolley station parking lots. And that was based on recent surplus land legislation. Next slide, please. A discussion of the site inventory can be found in Appendix C of the draft housing element, and the actual site inventory is Appendix eight of H of the housing element. The site inventory identified sites by APN to support a total of 11,823 total units. That's approximately 718 units over what we were required to identify. The site inventory identified 4,527 lower income units. Of those lower income units, a little over 3,000 are in Eastern Chula Vista and approximately 1,500 are in Western Chula Vista. The site inventory also identified 7,296 moderate and above moderate units. And those were split about 6,000 in Eastern Chula Vista and about 1,500 in Western Chula Vista. Um, again, I'll be available at the end to clarify any of these numbers. I know I threw a lot of them at you, uh, but this wraps up my portion of the presentation. Leilani is now going to walk you through the policies and implementation plan for the draft housing element. Thank you. So now that we've heard about RENA and the goal that we're trying to reach uh, to provide new housing to meet the demand for our community, we wanted to talk about the policy and the implementation plan, which is basically our roadmap. How do we get to all of these units? So we're going to talk a little bit about the policies and the programs that we are proposing for you. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. So in the past, the housing element was just a plan with some goals. And if you didn't achieve them, there wasn't really much of a penalty. We tried better in the next cycle. Um, so the public discussion has become more critical at this point in time because all of the new laws that really tie the hands of all local jurisdictions. So we all have to now comply with all these state laws, all the new law policies. And so we're now seeing lawsuits, more heavy regulation from HCD. And what you say and what you write in the housing element is committing you now. 
you have to provide strategies that will facilitate incentivize housing production and other housing needs in compliance with all of these laws that we've been talking about and all within some pretty reasonable time frames. So if you don't do what you say, you don't follow the state laws, the stat state can now refer jurisdictions to the attorney general's office, stopping building permits, and in some cases with some hefty penalty. So the box that cities are working in now and the community is seeing and in dealing with has gotten very, very small, very limited. Public dialogue now around housing issues, housing solutions are becoming more limited as our alternatives and the box we work in become smaller. Um, we went out, talked and looked at our demographics. We did community meetings to find out what would best address the community's needs. Um, that we're addressing state housing requirements. You're gonna see a lot of new programs and policies that really go to the heart of all these state laws. Next slide, please. So our first goal has remained consistent with previous housing elements. We want our residents to live in safe, livable and sustainable communities. So under this goal, the policies relate to maintenance and repair of housing, enforcement of building safety and housing codes, implementing state and local greenhouse gas reduction strategies and conservation policies and programs. Um, but new to this goal is now looking at some regulations on short-term vacation rentals. That's become the new thing in this cycle. So we wanna try to preserve our housing for our long-term um, needs of our residents. So that's a new policy that you're seeing in the housing element under this goal. Next slide, please. So we are a very diverse community here in Chula Vista. One housing type will not fit all the needs. By law, we're required to identify adequate sites available for the development to accommodate over 11,000 11, new housing units for people at all different economic groups. Given all the new laws we're now implementing, we have to do everything we can to ensure that housing gets built, that we're addressing barriers, that we are encouraging housing construction. So we'll find opportunities to modify our zoning code when they're appropriate. We'll look at reducing processing time. Um, we started this under the COVID-19 uh, pandemic with electronic submittals and then streamlining as much as possible. So we're providing our development community with certainty and flexibility. We will also wanna make sure that our housing helps our most vulnerable population groups and those with special needs, such as our seniors, disabled veterans, students, and our homeless population. Um, addressing their housing needs is going to be specific to what they need at that point in time. New in this, housing element um, are a couple of policies that go directly to the new laws and that are changing the way we do business. So the first we've kind of alluded to is the no net loss scenario where we have to make sure that at every year, at every point in time, as projects are being approved and built, that we're maintaining enough land to get to those 11,000 new housing units. The other new laws are related to streamlining of certain types of projects. So streamlining or by right development of those affordable housing developments of 50% or more, um, supportive housing projects, uh, low barrier navigation centers for the homeless. Those are by right and just pretty much building permit, no environmental review. So I wanted to spend some time on no net loss. Um, next slide, please. No net loss has been in existence for about probably a year or so now, um, and it ensures that development opportunities remain available throughout the planning period to accommodate RENA, particularly the lower and moderate income households. So in the housing element, Appendix H is an Excel spreadsheet of parcels and parcels of land to get us to the 11,000 units. If a parcel has been identified in our housing element site inventory um, to accommodate RENA, then as a project comes forward, we need to verify and look at that project and make sure is that, is that project, is the site being down zoned to reduce density? Is a project being approved on that site that lowers the residential density? Or 
there are fewer units or fewer units at the income level that's shown in the inventory. If that's the case, then there are certain findings that we have to make as a city. Next slide, please. So we would have to be able as a city to say that we have still in our back pocket somewhere in the city, another site that would be available to still meet the arena. If we don't, um, then we need to look at what site would we have to up zone in order to meet the arena number. And then you have to up zone that site within 180 days. And this is a requirement on the city. It's not a requirement on development. So we're not able to disapprove a project simply because it would result in a loss in a site and a loss in the number of units. So I'd like to run you through an example of how no net loss would work. Next slide, please. So in this example, we have a parcel that's been identified it's coming in, um, it's been identified with 60 units and 60 units for lower income. That's what we have said for RENA. The proposed project that's coming in, is coming in at a lower density at 20 dwelling units per acre at 40 units. And the units will be market rate, a market rate product, so above moderate. So in this scenario, we're losing 20 units that we had identified in the RENA and we're losing density. So in this case, we would have to make the findings required to, that we still do have another piece of property somewhere else that can accommodate the loss of 20 units. And so therefore there is no net loss. In the second scenario we have, this project, this site has been identified as having 10 units, 10 units for moderate income, the proposed project is coming in at 10 units, so there's no loss of units, but it's a market rate product and not moderate. We still have a loss in units because the loss is in the income category. So we're looking, we're checking not only on the number of units, but what income category did we assign that parcel in our site inventory? So this is a whole new way of doing business now for all jurisdictions in reviewing uh, residential projects that are coming forward. Next slide. So under goal two, another state law that we are dealing with is AB 671, which requires that all housing elements now provide a plan to incentivize and promote the creation of accessory dwelling units particularly when they're being made available for our lower income population. So within the housing element, you'll see a number of ADU programs and policies where we're going to do some outreach to the community about what's the process like? What do you have to do? We'll be monitoring and every year the production of ADUs, seeing that they're happening or not happening, and then maybe identifying what are those barriers. We'll do a mid-cycle review. So in four years, we'll look at our ADU production and how has it been? Do we need to do some changes? Uh, many communities out there already have permit ready plans. So we'll explore that process. Um, there are lots of folks in our community who are actually already have ADUs. They've converted a garage. They've um, taken a, a, a shed or an accessory structure and made it into a living space. So maybe there's a process where we grant them amnesty and get those units to be legal and meeting health and safety standards. Uh, the tiny home movement is big nowadays. So looking at um, movable tiny houses as part of our zoning code. Um, and then lastly, perhaps providing financial assistance uh, to those homeowners who want to do ADUs and they want to restrict them to for affordability purposes to our lower income households. Next slide, please. So what we have done for this new housing element is we actually pulled out affordable housing as its own goal. 
Um, because we have over 4,500 units that we're aiming for, it's 41% of our RENA number. Our population is 45% lower income. We felt that this uh, income category required a goal onto itself. So trying to create those opportunities for affordable housing and particularly in vulnerable areas and in areas of opportunity. The areas of opportunity also address new housing element law that takes a look at fair housing and making sure that all people, despite their economic background, have access to areas of opportunity. Next slide. So with that, um, we're trying to accommodate that many new units. I wanted to give you an understanding of what type of affordability we are looking at and what the current market conditions are. So for a low income household to be considered low income, a family of four is making about $92,000 a year. In accordance with state definitions and their state affordability calculator, the maximum monthly rent that that type of that family could afford for a two bedroom is just is almost $2,000 a month. Two bedroom apartments, some of our newer developments, the Alexan and Millennia, a two bedroom is going for $2,750. Del Oro on Broadway, which is on the west side of town, is actually going for almost $2,800 a month in, in rent. So we're not seeing a lot of our new apartment communities that are hitting that mark for our lower income. It hits the mark perhaps for our moderate income households, but not for lower income. And then on sales prices, that's a little bit grimmer for our low income households. According to the state, they can afford a maximum of about $206,000 um, in housing price. I don't know of a whole lot of product out there, particularly newer product that is in line. So just a few examples, a three bedroom out at Strata in Eskaya is 550,000. The Pinnacle in Millennia is at 550,000. Even those sales prices are beyond the affordable sales price marked for our moderate income households at just over for $402,000. So the market conditions currently are really not able to hit the mark. And that's why you saw in the fifth cycle um, that we didn't have a lot of new product that was hitting the types of affordable sales prices or rents. Everything we've been doing the last couple of year, years has all been for above moderate housing. Next slide. So with that, that means that we might want to take a real good look at our balanced communities policy. That policy has not been updated since its inception in the 80s. So we will be looking at in the next coming year at uh, whether or not we need to increase um, the applicability and the requirement thresholds. Do we need to take a look at our in lieu housing fee? Is it sized right? Do we want to have an actual ordinance versus a policy? So the bounce communities policy has done a lot for us in Chula Vista and particularly related to getting affordable housing in areas of opportunity, but maybe it's not enough to reach some of these arena goals that we're trying to uh, reach. We're also needing to do a relook at our density bonus or affordable housing incentives ordinance. Um, every year there has been an update in state law to density bonus. We're probably a few years behind in updating. Density bonus law now includes student housing. Um, there's a lot of reductions in parking when you're near transit and Chula Vista's land is pretty much near transit. Um, and then there's significant amounts of incentives for affordable housing that's built at 100% affordability. And then some changes in density and incentives that are allowed. Um, for 100% affordable projects, for example, the new legislation states that they are no longer required to provide any on-site parking and that they can have as much as an 80% density increase if near and if they're near transit 
there's absolutely no density maximum on 100% affordable products. Next slide. New this year is SB 330. SB 330 also has a replacement housing obligation. So it doesn't work really well for those communities that have older areas where they're trying to redevelop because this requires that you replace like for like when you're demolishing units or they have been demolished in the last five years. And it applies to what we call restricted projects. So an affordable housing development definitely like for like replacement, but also in the law, it talks about rent control uh, products. And a couple of years ago, the state passed state rent control. So if you have a development where that unit is subject to state rent control, then you have a replacement housing obligation. And when we talk like for like, um, that means that the same number of bedrooms, the same income level, and if you can't demonstrate the income level, we go with what the HUD census tract says. And when we've looked at that for Chula Vista and the west side, that's talking about all very low income households. And then they would also be required to provide relocation benefits and then first right of refusal for displaced tenants. Next slide, please. So then goal four is about promoting equitable and accessible housing options and the availability of resources to our public. Um, we hear all the time that we didn't know that there was a program or that there was help available, or we didn't know because we didn't understand the language. It was either too technical or um, you just provide that the, the information in English. So this is all about trying to make ourselves more accessible, um, trying to be equitable and get those resources out to the community. And then also being transparent in our programs and our policies and what we're doing. So involving people in decision-making um, and being part of the process. Uh, new this time around, we will be doing an environmental justice element. And then because you're hearing a lot of new laws, a lot of restrictions and things that folks have never heard about or don't maybe even like or support, um, we really need to work better with our community to try to, uh, to help them to understand the new laws, to understand the new requirements and who exactly is low income. At 92,000 a year, I don't think that that is what the community necessarily understands as, as lower income. So um, really trying to achieve community support and education related to our housing issues. Next slide. So in the name of trying to be accessible and equitable throughout the housing element pr process, whether it was in the development or now that we have the housing element, um, providing that document and explaining the document, um, we've gone out to the community. Um, we have followed a policy of trying to leverage already engaged residents and stakeholders. We've done a lot of meetings with our Housing Advisory Commission, the Commission on Aging. Um, we've been to you several times, the Growth Management Oversight Commission. We've engaged those um, advocacy groups that we work day in and day out with. So whether it's SBCS across the way from us, the Regional Task Force on the Homeless, um, we have our Development Oversight Committee, and then our Building Industry Association that we work closely and regularly with. In this COVID-19 environment, um, we recognize that outreach would take a different turn. We relied heavily on an online survey, uh, did a lot of social media posts and blasts about that survey and wanting to get information. We, in fact, did a 30,000 plus direct mailer about our online survey. Um, this was done in connection with the Census 2020 efforts. Um, we did try to hold a few community meetings via uh, via WebEx um, with our general community. We met with our stakeholder groups, whether they were in the real estate industry or whether they were our social service providers or our educators. So really trying to get the community engaged. 
Um, but as we all know, this has been a difficult time um, in our environment and many in our community and many of our providers and educators are, are more concerned with really the lasting and the, uh, the lasting effects of COVID-19 from the financial impacts and the health issues that have arisen. So um, we've tried our best and I think we've we've reached out to a number of organizations and stakeholder groups and community members to get them engaged in the housing element and the policies that we are proposing. So our next steps, next slide please. And then the next slide. We're here to you tonight to ask for uh, your recommendation for this to go before the City Council and to go to HCD. We'll be getting their uh, review of our document fairly shortly here. We plan to do that by the end of the week, pending comments that we might receive from you. Um, during the summer, we expect that HCD will be reviewing our document. They have very specific timelines to review the document. And if all goes well, um, we hope to be then by to City Council by July 2021. Um, that is pending HCD's review and approval of the document. And the deadline for approval would be in early August. And that's to remain in compliance with the law where we don't have to do this every four years and we can go to an eight year cycle. Next slide. And so with that, the recommended action we are asking of the Planning Commission and the Housing Advisory Commission is recommending City Council adopt the negative declaration and the housing element update for the general plan for the 2021-2029 planning period. Um, I've also listed there our website address so that if anyone out there who's listening or is interested in taking a look at the housing element, um, it is available on the website. That concludes staff's presentation for this evening. Staff, thank you on the, um, hey, Leilani, thank you for the incredibly thorough, um, absolutely thorough uh, presentation. Um, so this is a good time for us to do clarifying questions. So, so colleagues on the planning commission and, and colleagues on the housing commission, if you have any clarifying questions, so these are not opinions, these are solely clarifying questions on staff's presentation, uh, please indicate so. You can raise your hand or you can use the, um, I believe you could just raise your hand. All right, we're gonna have a clarifying question uh, first by Commissioner Zaker, followed by Commissioner Torres, and then followed by uh, Commissioner Rosa, De La Rosa after that. All right, Commissioner Thank Zaker, take it away. Thank you, Chair Gutierrez. A question for staff. Can you um, uh, explain the difference between uh, community facility zoned, land zoned, uh, there was a section that that, that uh, said that, that one of the options would be um, land zone for community facilities to be considered for affordable housing. Can you give me an example of what that is? I'm not I'm not sure if I understand. What what is community facility zone land? Can you give me an example of that? Yes, uh, this is uh, Scott Donaghy from Advanced Planning. Um, on the eastern side of Chula Vista, we have a number of sites within the spa plans out east called community purpose facilities. You'll see things like churches built on them, like memory facilities, retirement homes, those kinds of things that were deemed to be a community need and something that should be planned for with the spot plan. Um, they traditionally operated in that realm though and not been for affordable housing just to put an affordable housing project on a site. We have a number of them that are like senior housing that are associated with a church or with something else on site, um, but this would be a little bit different thing, opening it up to affordable housing by itself. Thank you. And then uh, after that, it was Commissioner Torres, I believe. Commissioner Torres, uh, if you have clarifying questions for staff. Yeah, if I, if I may, Chair Gutierrez, I just want to clarify too, is that um, the questions right now is just limited to the presentation, but not the uh, actual uh, housing element update, correct? We'll have an opportunity to ask questions about the update itself, correct? Or should we ask these questions now? Hello, me? Are you yeah. asking? See, it's clarifying questions. I'm, I'm asking you: Is that should we? Is it? Is the question period now just limited to the to the presentation, or 
if, can we ask questions about the housing element update? I would keep it limited to the presentation okay, and then perfect. we can go into further questions once okay. we go into deliberations. Okay. Commissioner Torres. Sounds good. So let me ask one question then. And uh, first, I want to commend Lalani and her staff for the HP update. It was uh, really um, well done. And I want to commend the Housing Commission for its guidance. But relative to the presentation, um, First, I want to thank Lalani for uh, providing me an opportunity to engage her about the balanced communities policy because I had some real questions about that, how it was applied to a housing project that came before the planning commission. And she and I engaged in some emails. And uh, so I want to put that on the record. So, because um, I was a little bit troubled by the fact that uh, unlike the density bonuses, which um, uh, is actually uh, going to be revised with changes to the municipal code that there was no um, uh, re uh, revision of the of the balanced po communities policy that was included in the HE update. So I want to ask Lalani is that when can the, I would presume it would come before the planning commission uh, and or the housing commission when can either uh, commission anticipate a revision of the balanced community policy? Because uh, Lilani, you and I, uh, pursuant to our dialogue, uh, the current policy is very problematic, especially with regard to a Commissioner Torres. Commissioner Torres, uh, with, with, uh, I, I understand. I'm asking you. the question. No, so no, no. But let me, let me clear. It's clarifying okay. questions, but when you say problematic, when you say things that don't make it sound clarifying, it sounds like that's something that should be safe for deliberations. So, Commissioner well, Torres, really question. When, can it, when is that policy revision going to be brought uh, to the okay. but, 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 but let's be clear that you need to make sure that it's you're, you're in clarifying and not putting any kind of a opinion or opining on anything. Okay, so I'll let so let's answer the question. Sure. So um, that question comes up fairly often um, because we're not presenting you necessarily our recommendations of what the balanced communities policy is. Um, as we stated in goal four, we believe that all of these types of planning, uh, uh, these planning policies and these housing policies that the community, that stakeholders like the planning commission, the housing advisory commission, that they have a part and participate in what actually gets reviewed. We have stated in the housing element that we intend to engage in the balanced communities policy fairly quickly and to have an update um, or resolution and alternatives to that policy rather um, within a couple of years time. Um, but we are, that, that's probably one of our top priorities in this uh, in this next coming year. There's a lot of work programs for us on the housing element. Okay, that's uh, clarifying I'll questions. Reserve the other questions. I'll reserve the other questions till later. Thank you, Commissioner Torres. Uh, Commissioner Michael De La Rosa. Hi, thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you, staff. That was a great presentation. Um, really, I. I I was going to ask a question in regards to the bouncing um, provision on the policy, and, and I think Lilani answered that in regards to when we might see that I was looking um, in regards to the tools to achieve goals three and four. So it looks like that, that schedule is more to come. So I was, I, I didn't, I looking through the attachments, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss that in regards to the discussions on those tools and when that be coming forward. But my clarifying question, um, my second clarifying question was that we talked about some villages in the east and down zoning. Um, I just could staff clarify in terms, I, I think that I had to do in regards to the net zero loss in regards to, I understand the villages were identified the zoning were anticipating certain build out and, and, and units. So I imagine that was in conjunction with, with uh, the developer and the master plan that is going forth there. But I just, I, I didn't understand that in terms of, I think it's in terms to make sure that um, we can achieve those goals, but could staff clarify that again in regards to, I think it was going from six units per acre to 30 units per acre and how we, um, are, are we losing those units for, and I understand that we have a planning supply, I think for middle income, but I, I just want to make sure, are we now, do, do we lose those or, or how, how does that work? Or could you yeah, clarify me, staff? I appreciate it. Let me clarify, uh, Commissioner De La Rosa. Um, down zoning is probably the, the, the wrong term. <clears throat> we have a number of communities on the east. Uh, such as like villages like village eight west village nine village 10 that have all been approved they've all been through city council 
they have um, what are called site utilization plans that show all of the neighborhoods and they show some kind of a density range for those neighborhoods typically. Um, we have a number of them in Village 8 East and Village 9 in the uh, town center that, that have densities that are higher than 30 units to the acre. Say uh, the example I was using is say it's 60 units to the acre that that's what's planned for. We routinely see developers come in and perhaps they have a site that allows 150 units and they come in with 146 units, you know, just four units fewer than what, than what we are planned. But that causes us to have to go into that mode of making no net loss findings, identifying other sites to pick up those four units in this case. So we're trying to figure out a way to get away from some of that and get away of having to make no net loss findings with every project that comes forward and having to go back and identify and rezone sites. So the way that we did that was we took these, these areas that were, say like this example, 60 units to the acre, we reduced it for the purposes of our evaluation to 30 units to the acre, um, so that if they come in with less, we don't have to make no net loss findings, we don't have to rezone other parcels. It's not a down zone, those units don't necessarily go away. What typically happens in a lot of these villages is those units just become a pool and kind of go from site to site and they pick up four over here, eight over there, and lose one here and it just kind of moves around. Typically they're not lost though. Thank you. I just want to, I, I just wanted to, that that's helpful. I also wanted to understand that it's not a cost to the, the landowner, the developer to have to, to go back and recapture those units, but it, it doesn't look like that's the case. And, and when you have this, this specific plan, those units are moved around. Is that, is that fair to it, say? That's fair to say. And, and as Leilani said in hers, it, it's not upon the developer to meet those. So, so if a developer, if we identified 100 units on their site and they only came in with 95, that's really the city's problem. And it's the city that has to go back and figure out where we have sites to pick up those additional units and where we can rezone to pick up those additional units. So it's really uh, no issue for the developer, so to speak. Okay, I, I just wanna make sure there's no added costs there. I mean, the housing affordability is what it is. I just wanted to make sure that that, that didn't add anything to those costs, but I, I uh, understand. So thank you for clarifying. You got it. Uh, any other clarifying questions from our colleagues? Remember, these are not opinions, but they are just clarifying questions for staff and the presentation that just took place. All right. Seeing none, we're going to open it up um, to, <clears throat> to public comment. So we're going to do a four minute pause to allow the public to submit any final comments on the item before commission deliberation. Commissioners, as a reminder, please refresh the view on your screen to ensure new comments appear. Staff, you may begin. Um, staff, um, can you please check the timer? Thank you. Um, can, uh, can we have a refresh on the timer? I think we're having some uh, technical difficulties. Thank you for your patience.
Uh, excuse me, staff. Um, we're not able to view the timer. Time's up. All right. All right. So taking a look at our fancy agenda here. Um, we're going to be going to the comment commenting period for this comment is now closed. Um, have the commissioners had enough time to read the comments? In case four minutes wasn't enough. 
All right. Looks like y'all read the comments. And um, okay, uh, and, and Commission Secretary, would you be so kind as to, for the record, um, announce how many comments we had in favor and opposed to the item? We did not receive any comments for this item. All right. And then lastly, um, do any commissioners have comments or questions? And this is where we get into the fun part. Can I ask my questions now or should, I'll, I'll defer to the other ones? Actually, yeah. Um, well, we'll uh, we're going to start with uh, Commissioner Bustamante and then Commissioner Torres, you can right after her. Please. Thank you, Chair Gutierrez. Hello, everybody. Um, I just want to share with you that over the last year, we in the Housing Advisory Commission have seen Leilani and the staff of the and her staff work on this project and I am incredibly proud of the outcome and how how intensive they work to make sure that it has it covers every corner um, particularly of notice is a new regulation that includes short-term rentals I really applaud them for including that in this effort so I just you know I don't see us straying from supporting this and I know there's a lot of technicalities that need to be um, taken care of but believe me they have already taken care of so many details and I am just very proud of them so I wanted to share that with the planning commission in in now that you have to move forward in in, in supporting this item thank you thank you Commissioner Bustamante Commissioner Torres have at it sir well I can wait if anybody else has any questions or comments um everybody no okay I'll, I'll, then I'll ask my questions these aren't these aren't comments per se but just questions of staff um, so, if I may, uh, within page eight of the staff a report mentions the master plan communities within East Chula Vista. Appendix C notes that there's a citywide housing development capacity of 11,828 units exceeding the RENIC requirement, of which 75% can be made available from housing projects within these communities. So, is the city going to start mandating affordable housing set asides for all future projects in these master plan communities, especially for low and extremely low income households? That's question one. Leilani, I don't know if you want to answer this. You want me to take a stab at it? Um, sure, I'll try and take a stab at it. Um, I think that's yet to be determined. We already have a balanced communities policy, right? So we are already implementing a policy on our Eastern master plan communities, albeit it's 5% um, low, 5% moderate. So those are some of the technical details that we'll look to in the future, um, but that's already in play. Um, it may go to a higher percentage um, than the 5% already. Um, requested. But to a great extent, many of our communities have already fulfilled that balanced communities policy. Mm. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Torres, if I can add in so, too, any project on the east that's over 50 acres is already providing 10% of the units to, to, to low and moderate, like Leilani just said, Yeah, uh, and has been for a while. Okay, yeah, because we have a we have on our agenda um, a project on the east side of four or five additional units, and I didn't see any mention about the balanced community policy or any set asides, but that's for another discussion. So let me ask my other two questions. Appendix C, there was discussion regarding ABX 126 with regard to a $27 million obligation of low and mod income housing set aside funds owed to the Housing Authority, which is the successor to the Redevelopment Agency. And um, by when can the city expect to fully realize 50% or 100% of these funds? And is there a strategy on the use of these funds to facilitate the construction of affordable housing? So I apologize, this is Leilani. I don't have the document available um, with me right now, but we have the, the city of Chula Vista or the Chula Vista Housing Authority is the successor agency 
to right. the redevelopment agency after the dissolution of redevelopment. We have received all funding that is owed to us at this point in time. We currently do carry a surplus of funds available. Um, we will be deploying those funds, particularly for permanent supportive housing. And um, there are some statutory requirements as to how we spend those funds. And in fact, we are bringing forward a report on the balance of those funds to the council um, by March 30th, because we submit that to the state. Um, the city as a housing authority as well is a bond issuer. So we strategize um, in terms of uh, issuance of bonds, of uh, providing gap financing for any development that comes our way, whether it's within the balance, within the master plan communities, or if it's an Eastern development. Uh, we have the Anita Street project that I think Scott alluded to in the inventory that's down off of Anita Street in the Southwest area, where we're putting about $5 million into that project for some permanent supportive housing, as well as affordable housing for lower income people. So um, if you've been in the affordable housing game, you know that it takes leveraging of redevelopment dollars, home dollars, tax credits, bond financing, every financing under the sun to get it done. Um, and we do that and we're fortunate enough to be a bond issuer so that we have that ability um, to actually uh, be more proactive in the space of financing. Thank you, Lola, great, great answer. Okay, it's my last question. The attached letter by the San Diego Housing Federation had some great suggestions that I didn't see addressed in any of the company materials. Am I wrong? If I'm not wrong, do you plan to explore these recommendations? So we do actually, so for our, I think the letter you're talking about is from the Housing Federation mm -hmm. and related to boomerang funds. Uh, boomerang funds is where a city will voluntarily set aside some of its tax increment back for affordable housing. The city has not chosen to do that because we do have uh, funds available through redevelopment and as a bond issuer related to the permanent um, PHLA. Uh, we do have those funds that's over about a million dollars that's out of SB2. Um, we are going to be using those funds for permanent supportive housing, perhaps an ADU financing program, or perhaps even for funding of our emergency shelter. Uh, we have a five-year plan for that. Um, we have been awarded those funds and we'll be looking for a permanent supportive housing project in the near future. I believe that that is the leveraging of funds is within the housing element. What about the deed restrictions? Um, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not quite, can you refresh my memory for me, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Let, me, Torres? Uh, let me see if I can you know, bear, bear with us. I apologize for being a little, uh, no, and I apologize that I don't have the document right in front of me. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Torres, you're asking some pretty good questions. So, so continue if you know, if you must. Okay. <laughs> I just got, I just got to learn not to include the uh, opinions of my clarifying questions, I guess. Bingo. Yeah. That's all. You're good. Okay. okay, if I may, uh, bear with me a little long. You got one of those old. Uh, I apologize. I'm going to look as well. Well, if anybody has any other questions, please, please go ahead. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll find it. Great, great. Yeah. Is, is, does anybody have any questions? Well, Leilani and, and also Commissioner Torres, look. Uh, we have a we have a, a question by Commissioner Zaker. One by Della Rosa and Commissioner Torres. As soon as we finish those two, we'll go back to you, and that'll give staff some time to research as well. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Zaker. Thank you, Chair. I have a comment on a question. My comment is, I'm, I'm uh, happy to see that uh, there was a section included um, in the housing element about ADUs, and that uh, the city is doing even more than what it has been doing to really promote. Because I'm a proponent of ADUs and. And quite frankly, I've heard some some sidebar conversation from our some of our elected officials that you know they they felt that ADU um, eliminates uh, parking and that 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 wasn't really a good thing for the city. And I know you know parking can be a you can we can debate about parking all all, all day long. But um, personally, I'm I'm happy to see that at least ADU is being considered as a part and and piece of 
our overall housing uh, supply increase discussion. So, so that's a really good thing. And then um, here's a question, and, and I'm just going to ask it as I'm thinking it. It's kind of an abstract question, which is kind of sort of the the opposite of what what Commissioner, um, uh, my fellow commissioner, is asking. And while I recognize that we do need to do everything within our power to increase housing supply and certainly affordable housing. Um, but, but my question is, um, and this is really to staff. Anticipate, um, again, this is maybe just more of your opinion that these type of more stringent uh, requirements. Would in some way, shape or form discourage. Um, the development of additional housing in Chula Vista. Again, this is more of a, you know, kind of a developer question, but obviously anytime you impose additional um, low to moderate income, that does change the economics of how developers think about building because typically they're, they're in the business to make money. Uh, they're not doing this um, as a, you know, unless they're a nonprofit developer, but typically Developers, their objective is to build good quality housing and turn a profit. So, uh, again, my question is, uh, I'm sorry if I'm kind of jumping around, but do, do you feel that these additional or these more stringent restrictions, even though they are state mandated, we have to do it, would in any way slow down uh, the development or construction of additional housing in, uh, in, in our city? Anyone has any opinion that would like to share on this? So I'm going to try and take a stab at that, Commissioner Zaker. Um, we do have a lot of legislation that we have to address, um, and we have to because it's state law. That doesn't mean that the law necessarily makes sense. I think when Scott uh, brought forward that slide that talked about 15, 18, 20, um, that's a pretty fast moving legislature and putting together all those bills. Do they all make sense? Do they all work hand in hand? Not necessarily. Um, I think from a practitioner standpoint, will we see more affordable housing? Not necessarily. Um, affordable housing is a result of financing. Um, this is a market situation. Can we absolutely make things a little bit easier for developers? Yes, we certainly can. We can streamline. We can um, provide them flexibility, provide them certainty and process. Um, so I don't think the market is going to stop what it's doing. And I don't think that the affordable housing industry is going to stop what it's doing. Um, this just makes things a little bit easier. And sometimes it makes things a little bit more complicated, honestly. Thank you, Leilani. I know the question that I'm asking is it's it's probably beyond what what we can discuss, but nonetheless, as a commissioner, I feel I have an obligation to really consider all sides. Again, um, you know, I I am I I am in agreement. The, the, this is a market financing uh, complex issue. Uh, so again, my hope is that as we comply with state law, as we should, that we don't you know, hopefully slow things down because we have worked extremely hard to incentivize developers to come and and develop and invest in our community because that creates other type of economic um, activity. So that that's just uh, my point. Thank you, uh, Chair, for allowing me to um, get my question out in a roundabout way. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Zaker. We're gonna to go to Commissioner Del Rosa, and then uh, and then uh, Leilani will will continue on with Commissioner Torres's. Actually, it looks like uh, Commissioner uh, Caro is gonna be after Del Rosa. Actually, that's okay. Okay, all right, cool. All right, uh, Commissioner Del Rosa. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, really, honestly, I um, Commissioner Zaker brought up the point that I was gonna bring up. Um, I think we're. I, I think everybody in the region in San Diego region. I don't want to speak for everybody, but I, we we certainly know that. Affordable housing is a is a is a major concern for our residents, um, and I, I think most people are very supportive of the idea of affordable housing. But but it's a, as I understand it, it's very complex, and it's something that you have to be very creative with. And I think Leon Leon had said earlier that um, there's a lot of work to do, and and there's a lot of issues uh, in regards to how to be creative, uh, how to be creative with this and comply with state law. Um, and I think that's where I, I wanted to go in regards to the, the balanced housing policy and to understand how that would come back 
so folks can participate and that we can, you know, really help to uh, not only educate ourselves and the commissions, but but the residents of Chula Vista in regards to what the goals are for our city um, uh, and the vision that that our, the, the residents and our electeds have have laid out um, in the context of you know the new the new legislation that we're dealing with. But but in all, uh, Chairman, that's where I was going in regards to just really looking to understand when the um, um, balanced housing policy and the tools that might be looked there and the discussion that might be had. I, I, I just for clarification understand that that those elements, um, the housing element will be will be going forward, and those housing elements and tools and that discussion is going to be a bigger discussion. I guess that would be my question um, for all the reasons that we stated in Commissioner's Acre, and I think the rest of us stated in regards to. Um, how how to tackle this issue and to be creative, understanding the nuances and the uh, the issues that industry faces, but also um, affordable housing developers and advocates and what we're trying to do and visualize and visualize our own vision. So, uh, thank you for allowing me to say that. But that's really and just understanding of staff can respond to um, how uh, if they have the schedule at this point on um, the balance, balance housing policy. And I certainly understand if they don't because it's a lot. But that's why I was I wanted to see if we had specific answers on that. So this is Leilani again. Um, in terms of having a very specific work program for the balanced communities policy, no, we we have not um, worked that out. I think uh, as housing staff, we are also still uh, working with COVID nineteen scenarios right now, um, but we absolutely would bring forward something that involves all the different stakeholders. Um, it's a very important program for the city, for the community, for our developers. Um, so that isn't something that we're, we take lightly and would want to have all people, uh, all stakeholders, all of, all of our community at the table to talk about the policy and how it would best um, address the issues from all around. So likely in the next, I mean, we would likely have to come forward in the next year. Great, thank you. I think that's also helpful to just put on the record in terms of understanding what's going forward and, and the work implementation plan that's going to follow. So thank you for the clarification. Commissioner Kettle, you're next. Thank you. Um, I uh, well, for, first I, I just wanted to thank um, staff uh, Leilani and her, her team uh, for the wonderful presentation and, and all the work and energy that they put uh, into. Uh, into the housing update, uh, housing element update. I, I more or less have an observation. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of stuck uh, when I saw that figure. I believe it's the Del Oro apartment community in, in on Broadway of having a rent of 2,795 for a two bedroom, um, a two bedroom apartment, and how that uh, could impact not just you know, let alone a, a, a moderate income household, but even upper income household, how that could put a, a strain into their finances uh, in terms of that family transitioning into home ownership. Uh, I say that because oftentimes during our uh, housing commission talks, we always tie in not just the affordable housing piece, but how that can transition into home ownership. Uh, and kind of on the same lines, I think uh, Commissioner Zaker just, just brought up is, is, is um, you know, that communication between between different programs, you know, different, different uh, uh, you know, interest in terms of, of, of building housing, of course, but also, uh, you know, the, the communication among other types of, of uh, initiatives, such as bringing additional jobs to the city that could align to, you know, essentially just, just affording uh, living here in our, in our city. I, I think that's an important topic. And, you know, that, that was just, once again, I, <laughs> it's not really a question, uh, a direct question, but it's something that just caught my attention just by being stuck on that figure. Um, you know, a, a lot of modern income household uh, would would struggle making that $2,795 monthly uh, rent payment. It's just an overall observation. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, any colleagues have any other questions? We're going to resume with uh, Commissioner Torres's. All right, Commissioner Torres uh, and Leilani, uh, if you're ready okay. to. Uh, if I may, but. Uh, yeah. First, let me come on what Sethio said is that, uh, yeah, that is kind of problematic because I live on the, on the west side of Chula Vista and that rent is more than what I pay mortgage payments. So, yeah, that's yeah. kind of tough. So, in, in the letter, Lilani, uh, it, uh, I'm going to read what it, what it says. 
We recommend that the housing element specifically include a goal to prioritize funds made available through the permanent local housing allocation, also known as the Buildings, Home, and Jobs Act, SB2, for the, for the development of deed-restricted affordable housing, maximizing the use of these funds to build housing for extremely low, very low, and moderate-income households will help the city meet its arena obligations. Yes, so we do actually prioritize deed restricted housing with that funding source. Um, our five year plan calls for permanent supportive housing as well as um, AGU assistance with, that, with those funds. We have also recognized the need for our homeless population and addressing their needs as well. Um, the legislation does allow for us to um, fund homeless services and, and homeless shelters. Uh, that is part of the five year plan if needed. Um, so we do call that out. Um, and I think that that is something that uh, the re that uh, the housing federation would prefer to see us put deed restricted housing than to use the funds for homeless services. However, the legislation does clearly allow that as an eligible use. Okay, thank you, Lilani, and, and again, great job, and thank you for engaging me on the balanced community policy, because as you heard by the other commissioners, we really need to uh, tackle that, and I know it's going to be a big, big project. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any additional comments from or, or any deliberation any call, uh, from my colleagues? Okay, I, ha I have some comments myself. I, I think that uh, Commissioner Carroll actually mentioned some really important things regarding simply what we look at uh, when we think about affordable housing. $2,000 a month is an incredible amount of money for a two bedroom apartment. And when you're trying to save up and it, it's just, it's, it, we, we all see it with the, with the San Diego Union Tribune or any of the newspapers we're reading about how San Diego is hitting record highs when it comes to, um, our residential costs for, for housing. And, you know, I just appreciate this conversation. I definitely appreciate the comments on my colleagues and also staff mentioning what's been going on. We have a whole lot going on and right, we still have a 10. How long is our wait list? It's like a 10 year wait list for, for section section 8. Voucher programs, Leilani. Yeah, it's, it's so. Yes, every waiting list we have is 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 10 years long. When we have an affordable housing development that comes online, we usually will have a so say it's a 200 unit project. We'll have 10,000 people sign up for an interest in it. And, and, and the other fascinating thing, too, is that we're, we're looking at, at least from what I heard um, with the new president that came in, there's been some conversations about, and you, you probably heard of this, you know, better, you probably looked at this more than I have, Lelani, but about having these vouchers no longer uh, actually be an entitlement program. And that would fundamentally change this wait list. You heard that? Yeah, the Section 8 program is a very good program for our very low income populations and those that are on limited or fixed income. Um, changes to that would certainly help. Okay, so we'll, I'm just hoping that we'll, we see something change where Section 8 hopefully becomes an entitlement because at the rate that it's going, it's getting pretty, pretty high for folks to be able to survive and, uh, and it's using a whole lot of their, uh, their income, their household income, I would say. Uh, any other final comments from my colleagues? All right, we're going to. Uh, does anybody have a motion to approve this item? Chair Gutierrez, um, I'd like to move that uh, we approve resolution MPA 21 001, recommended City Council adoption of negative declaration and the housing element update of the general plan for the 2021 2029 planning period. Perfect. And Vice Chair Zaker, we have our motion. Do we have a second to that motion? I'll second it. Commissioner, oh, sorry. Oh, we're going to have a Commissioner Caro is going to second it. Um, Just want to make sure we're able to do this. Right? Yeah, is this a, one of those things where <laughs> housing votes first and then count, uh, planning votes second, or is this like a all of us vote together? Forgive me my notes. As though it looks like it's a planning commission vote. It looks like it's a vote. Chair, uh, Chair Gutierrez. Yeah, make sure I'm reading this correctly. Chair, Chair Gutierrez, this is the city attorney. Um, yeah, yeah, just, just looking at the agenda, it looks like this is just a planning commission action. 
Okay, got it. All right. So, so we're going to take the. I'll take my second. So I'll have my I'll have my uh, motion made by Commissioner Zaker, seconded by Commissioner Milburn, and my colleagues in the Housing Commission. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, and we're going to begin. Um, if Madam Clerk can read through our uh, read us the vote. Thank you. <clears throat> I will now take the vote for the Planning Commission, please. <clears throat> Commissioner Burroughs. Yay. Commissioner De La Rosa. Yay. Commissioner Milburn. Aye. Commissioner Torres. Uh, aye. Commissioner Zaker. Aye. Chair Gutierrez. Aye. And Commissioner Nava is absent. <clears throat> Thank you. Looks like the eyes have it. So it's going to go over to the it goes to the housing commission at this time, correct, Mr. Shirey? Where's that it? No, that's it. We're 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 on to uh, item number two. Okay, well, we're going to adjourn the housing commission meeting and appreciate all of you being here today. It's wonderful to have you colleagues here, and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Good to see all of you. All right. Thank, Thank you. Likewise. All right, it's party time, y'all. Um, I was looking at some of these things. Okay. So I've got this pile of paperwork next to me. Let's take a look. Okay. The next item on the agenda is item number two, DR200010 uh, Otay Ranch Village 2, neighborhood R25A. This item will be presented by Ms. Caroline Young, Associate Planner, Development Services. Does staff have a presentation? Um, yes. Take your time, Caroline. Good evening, Chairman Cortez and members of the Planning Commission. I'm Caroline Young, Associate Planner in the Development Services Department, presenting the Otay Ranch Village 2. R25 in the apartment. The proposes to construct a 405 unit apartment complex with one to three car garages, carports, and open parking, in addition to a clubhouse and other open space areas on a vacant 14 acre site. The site is situated on the east side of Chula Vista within the Otay Ranch Village 2 area. The site is south of Olympic Parkway and located adjacent to Heritage Road. Here is a closer view of the site. It is also adjacent to Santa Victoria Road, Santa Carolina Road, and Santa Luda Road. Adjacent land uses include single family and multi-family homes, a future park, a school, commercial shopping center, industrial site, and the Otay landfill. Just across Heritage Road is the Otay Landfill and the future industrial site. And further down the street is a vacant site for a future commercial shopping center that will be in front of the site along Heritage Road. Santa Victoria Road are single family homes. To the east across Santa Carolina Road are multifamily homes. Further down the street are the two vacant lots for the future park and school site. And to the south are multi-family homes. Pictures of the proposed site. The top photo is at the corner of Heritage Road and Santa Victoria Road. And further up the road is a traffic circle shown in that bottom picture there that leads into the Otay Ranch Village 2 area. South. Santa Carolina Road, you can see the proposed site on the right hand side and the multi family on the left. And the bottom picture is looking back at the site with a view of the Otay landfill in the distance to the west. There will be a total of 20 buildings with a variety of two to four story townhomes and residential flats and a clubhouse building. The two to three story townhomes are located on the left hand side of the project site. With a with a four story residential flat on the other side. In the center of the site is the clubhouse building. 
The project consists of having one to three car garages, carports and open parking spaces throughout the site. There will be two driveways that will serve as the two access points for the project. One off of Santa Carolina Road, serving as the main entrance, and one off of Santa Luisa Road. Both of these driveways will have enhanced pavement. There are also several pedestrian paths throughout the site with enhanced pavement as well that creates the pedestrian connection within the project. There are also several recreational amenities for the residents. In addition to the clubhouse, there is a pool and spa area, a fenced in dog run, a playground, a courtyard area, a paseo and barbecue area with seating, and a plaza at one of the corner intersections. A view of some of those areas. So the courtyard has a turf area, some picnic tables with overhead, overhead shade structures, a fire pit with lounge seating a barbecue area and a family dining table. Adjacent to the clubhouse building will be the pool and spa with three cabanas, fireplace, lounge seating, and a six foot cascading water wall feature. There will be a private fence seating area that will have several picnic tables, an outdoor TV, a ping pong table, and three barbecue stations. The other pictures here show example of the seating wall that will be provided within the plaza area and the dog run with a synthetic turf. The playground area will have a play structure, a playhouse for ages two to three years old, and bench seating. This is the fourth showing the residential units for the townhome. There will be a total of 93 townhomes, which will either be two or three stories with a five to eight plus building. Each townhome unit will have a total of three bedrooms. And the drawing on the right hand side shows a sample of the units provided within the building. So the color shows two story units and the purple color shows the three story units with a three car garage. And the other colors are for the three story with the two car garage. So for a five plex building, you will get two units on the end that will be two stories, while the rest will be three stories. And there will also be some buildings that will only have one building height, such as that six plus, six plus shown here, with all of them being two stories. The colored site plan on the left shows the layout of the units, so you can get a sense of the various roof heights throughout the project site. This is an example of five plex. The two story units will have a two car garage on the first floor, along with the living, kitchen, and patio area. The second floor will have the three bedroom unit. The units in the yellow, yellow color will have, uh, will be three stories high. The two story garage, one bedroom, and patio will be provided on the first floor. The living room and kitchen are on the second floor with the balcony, and then the remaining bedrooms are on the third floor. The unit shown in blue will have the same features, but does not have the bedroom on the first floor, but rather they will be provided, provided all on the third level. The elevation of a five and six plex building. The front elevation view is what you can see along the street or courtyard area. This is a Santa Barbara style architectural building with tiled roof, chimneys, gable vents with metal bars, decorative shutters, covered patios. The two to four story buildings have a variety of different setbacks to provide interest and relief. This is an example of the seven to eight plex building. The seven plex elevation shows both two and three story units, while the eight plex shows all three story units. This is the plan of one of the residential flats. There are five different buildings, this one being the largest. Overall, there will be 312 residential flats from one to three bedroom units. So the picture on the left shows the range of the unit height from a one bedroom unit to a three bedroom unit. The picture on the right shows the one, one car garage provided on the first floor with the door leading into a hallway. And since these are flat units, the kitchen, the living room, and the bedroom are all being provided on the same level. 
the first four units will have a patio area while the upper units will have the balcony. And then the second and fourth floor for this building will have the remaining units on top of it. This is the elevation of the residential flats. This particular building, it will be placed along the corner of Santa Carolina Road and Santa Lisa Road. The bottom two pictures are what will be visible from the street. The top two photos shows the interior elevation with the one car garages and the upper units above it. And a tower element is also provided along the side elevation. These buildings will also have the same design as you as the townhomes did with the Santa Barbara theme. The color and materials of both the townhomes and the residential flat buildings. There will be light colored exterior cement plaster stucco with dark accent colors. The shutters will be a dark green color. A vinyl picket fence will be installed along the front patio area for the town, while a solid concrete wall with a gate will be provided in, in the patio area for the first four units of the residential flat. This is the first floor of the clubhouse building with the leasing office, bail box room, a fitness and gym room, kitchen and dining area, and a covered door space has a yoga and spin room, a game room, theater library, three conference rooms, and an open and covered terrace. This is the clubhouse building. The top two draw, uh, drawings is the view of what you will see from the pool area. The northwest view will be as you enter into the driveway into the project site that has the main entrance into the leasing office. The bottom drawing is what you will see along Santa Carolina Road. These are the proposed colors and materials for the clubhouse, which uses the same colors as the residential buildings do, but they also add different elements to it, such as the arch windows and openings, the circular windows and metal awnings. These slides represent the elevations for the entire project, showing both the townhomes and residential flats and how they will appear along the street. The top photo shows the street elevation along Santa Lisa Road with the residential flats and the secondary driveway in between the two buildings. The bottom picture shows the view from Santa Barbara Road on the opposite side of the project with the townhome. This shows the entire view from Santa Carolina Road. The top photo shows the four story residential flats. The middle drawing shows the clubhouse in the center of the photo adjacent to the main driveway entrance and, and the two and three story townhomes after that. I did receive some emails from the public, which was forwarded to the planning commission prior to the meeting. The neighbors did have concerns with traffic, uh, parking, views, pollution, and the amount of units on the site. For this project, there hasn't been any increase in units since the small plan was uh, up, updated and approved back in 2014 by the Planning Commission City Council. So staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt the resolution approving the design review permit subject to the conditions of approval provided in the resolution. So this concludes staff presentations and we are available for questions and the applicant will be here as well. Colleagues, do you have any clarifying questions for staff? Commissioner Burroughs, how about it? I do, I just a couple questions, Caroline. Um, the, um, I was trying to figure out is was the site originally zoned for multifamily residential or was it previously zoned for something different? I mean, it has always been zoned for multifamily residential. At one point, it was 330 units were allowed on there. And then back in 2014, the action was to allow 405 units. So okay. it's stayed at 405 units since then. Okay. So I was just wanting to clarify that the intent of a multifamily project was always was always the the idea for this for this piece of land. Um, yes. Okay. And then one another question. So this is a these are 
This is a for lease product, is that right? Or a for sale product? Uh, for, uh, for rent product. For rent, okay, yeah, so it's, these aren't, okay, great. And um, one more question. <laughs> is there a timeline for construction of the elementary school and the park that are in the adjacent area? I do know the park recently submitted a building permit and it's still under review by staff. So I would imagine as soon as the city issues a permit, they could start construction on that. Um, okay. they, the building permit was for restrooms and archway and some lighting. This um, is, the elementary, yes. This is Nick Lee with Baldwin and Sons. Um, the park across the street is actually under construction right now. They plan on having it completed somewhere around June of this year. And then depending on the, the turf kind of taking, it could be open as early as September. Okay, great. Um, great, that's that's all the questions I had, thank you. Colleagues, I don't see all your faces, so unfortunately, okay. I saw Commissioner Milburn and then Commissioner Torres. Just quick question, is that, um, for staff, is that the parcel adjacent to this proposed location uh, you mentioned that it's zoned for commercial. Is there a prospective project that's forthcoming or um, in the near future? And who's the developer? Um, yeah, if I can, get, I can answer again if you'd like, Caroline. Yeah, if I could get, um, can I be able to share my screen again, Steph? Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Oh, um, there is a, currently a design review application in process at the city for both the site that's immediately um, west of this site and the one um, directly south of that. So both the what's referred to as industrial two and industrial three in the um, village two spa plan. So that future commercial site you see on Carolyn's screen and across Santa Liza Road, um, the two of those together make up a retail complex that's currently going through the design review process. And I anticipate will be to you guys for review sometime later this spring. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And it's uh, Commissioner. Okay, so we have Commissioner Milburn on the. I think it was was uh, next. <clears throat> question. Yeah. Yeah. Just two uh, two quick questions. Um, you did say that the number of units had not been increased since uh, 2014. Is that right? Yes. Okay, and then. Um, the, the site of the future school, is that to be an elementary school or a middle school? Yes, an elementary school. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. All right, let me just make sure I'm kind of scrolling through some faces here. All right, any hands up for my friends? Oh, there you go, Commissioner Zaker. Um, I, I think one of the commissioners asked this, but I just want to make sure. So the applicant is not asking for any concessions, anything that they're not they're not permitted by zone to build on the site. Is that correct? No, they're not. Okay. All right. Um, any further uh, clarifying comments? We're gonna. All right. Seeing none, we're gonna adjourn. We're gonna open for public comments. And we're gonna have a uh, staff. You can put the four minute timer up.
All right, the commenting uh, period for this item is now closed. Have the commissioners had enough time to read the submitted comments? Madam Secretary, would you please announce for the record a number of comments received in favor or opposing this item? Yes, a total of seven comments were received in opposition. Thank you. All right, so uh, we're just going to start deliberation. Uh, my colleagues, who wants to kick us off? Commissioner Torres. If I may, is that I'm going to follow up on the e comment that we got. And, um, it kind of alludes to my previous question uh, on the HE update is uh, how many affordable housing units are set aside as part of this uh, 405 unit development project, or are there any? Anybody well, answer, like that? Hines answer that question for you? I'm sorry. Nick, I, um, I can answer it. The This is in other villages in Otay Ranch, there's a 10% inclusionary requirement. None of the units are provided on this site, but we are about to start processing an application for it to be located on the MU2 and MU3 sites in Village um, in Village 2. So that's kind of near the corner of Birch Road and La Media Road. And we're processing a about 179 unit affordable housing project that'll be deed restricted affordable. And that will cover the requirements and other projects in the village. And Nick, what's the timeline for that? We're anticipating to start design in the next month or so, have design review approval close to the end of the year and starting sometime in first quarter, end of first quarter next year with the construction. If I may, is that when that project comes before us, if, if staff and the developer could identify those affordable housing units for uh, just for our edification, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Any other uh, comments from my colleagues or motions from my colleagues? Commissioner Zaker. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know if this is more of a legal question, but um, so I, I appreciate uh, Nick saying that the uh, the required 10% set aside will be will be offered at a uh, alternative site, which is fine. Uh, we've we've seen other developers do that, but since that project has not come before us and it's still in the process, I'm just going to make a hypothetical, right? This project gets approved, approved, they go on the construction, and uh, due to some circumstances that may be outside of the developer's control they decide not to go through with the uh, affordable housing project. Uh, again, I'm, I'm just throwing a hypothetical, so, so, so bear with me. Um, how, how would that work from, from the city's um, permitting process perspective? And I appreciate the fact that uh, um, you share that these are going to be deed restrictors. So I get that. But since the timing is different, it, it appears to be a it could be as much of a 12 month um, time lapse between this project and, and the, the future affordable project. So how does that kind of play out? How does that work out? There's an affordable housing agreement that covers all of village two, and it sets triggers for the development of the affordable units. And so if the were not to be started while this project is going forward, other projects in the village would be stopped. They'd be um, permit restricted until we do meet the requirements of that affordable housing agreement. Okay, so there's an agreement in place. Can can city staff um, confirm that? Please? Yeah, I, I can okay. confirm that, Commissioner Zaker. We do have that agreement in place, and that is exactly the enforcement tool that we would use if Baldwin was not to deliver the units that they need to deliver per the agreement. All right. Thank you for clarifying. I've done it. <laughs> not to Nick, but <laughs> Again, not, 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 not that, you know, we, we the developers have been around our city for, for many years. They've done phenomenal projects as this one is, but, you know, as commissioners, we do need to ask. And if there are other public, uh, some of our citizens on this call, I mean, you know, they may be wanting to ask the same questions. So, so thank you for, for sharing that information. 
And, and Nick, unfortunately, you drew the short straw. You ended up doing your presentation on the day we were discussing Reno. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you do a presentation about affordable housing and have your item on the line. So, um, but we appreciate well, your uh, your graciousness. And it's an important question, especially when you do have a project like this that's not providing it on site, but has an alternative site selection for the for the affordable to make sure everybody knows when and how it is going to be developed. Absolutely. Colleagues, any other questions for uh, for Nick or any uh, staff? Uh, any any comments about the project? This is design review items. Anybody want to make a motion to to support this item? Mr. Torres, was that a hand? All right, we have a motion made by Commissioner Torres. Oh, Commissioner De La Rosa. Yeah. Did he make the motion? Yeah. I believe he made the motion. So, would you be I'll, seconding I'll, it? I'll second it. Uh, for the record, uh, we have Commissioner Torres making a motion and Commissioner De La Rosa seconding that motion to approve this item. Thank you. I will now request each member's vote, please. Uh, Commissioner Burroughs. Yay. Commissioner De La Rosa. Aye. Commissioner Milburn. Aye. Commissioner Torres. Aye. Commissioner Zaker. Aye. Chair Gutierrez. Aye. And Commissioner Nava is absent. Thank you. All right, that completes that item. Uh, Nick, congratulations. Have a lovely evening. Um, all right, so the next item Thank is item number, <laughs> the next item is item number three, which is our director's report. Tiffany, take it away. Good evening, commissioners. Um, just a couple updates for you guys. Uh, so while you've been having this great conversation around housing, um, we've actually been making some progress on our technology upgrades. So tonight is the first night that our secretary is using our new um, legislative software to take the minutes for this meeting. So this is new software that's being rolled out for our city council and our planning commission is gonna be the first boarding commission that's also gonna be on our new um, online platform basically for uh, agenda statements. So we're gonna move away from paper um, so tonight was the first night we tried minutes, um, fingers crossed that that went okay. And um, you'll be hearing from us in the coming weeks with some um, trainings and guidelines on how to participate and how that's all going to work. But I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that that's coming. Um, and with that, uh, attendees will actually be able to just live stream and watch online, not have to um, log into a WebEx. So that will be much better for our uh, public and community that want to watch these meetings. And then the other update, because um, I did hear a little chatter at the beginning, um, we are looking to be back in council chambers for city council meetings um, in the next few months. So um, they are working very hard to make that happen. And I know that we are anxious to get our planning commissioner back, commission back in the chambers as well. So um, I will keep reinforcing that with the uh, decision makers, but I think um, as we get city council back in, then I think we'll be the next group to move back in as well. So I'll keep you guys updated on that, but um, we're moving that way. I, I volunteer as tribute. So if you want me to go in <laughs> early, I'm, I'm so comfortable with that. Uh, doing this in my garage is not as uh, glamorous as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Appreciate, appreciate the uh, volunteering. Sanitize the death. So whatever it takes. <laughs> Uh, is there any other, uh, any other, um, I guess anything for, for Tiffany? Anyway, congrats. It's good stuff. Thank good you. Good you. Yeah, and, and I guess I would just add, um, we are really looking forward to having this conversation around these housing programs with you and the community. And we think it's just a really important conversation to have, and we're, we're excited to have it with you all. So thank you for, um, engaging with us on this. All right. That brings us to item number four. Commissioner comments, any, uh, anything from my colleagues. Mr. Sure. Zaker. If I may, I know, I know it's late and we all um, probably want to go and have dinner, but, um, I, you know, for, for the, for the general public that submitted those comments, you know, 1st off, thank you for, for really engaging in our, in our. Democracy in our process and, and, uh, you know, I just want you to know that. That we read your comments and, and, you know, in some ways I have to concur with you, but. You know, we do have a housing shortage and anytime you add additional units. Uh, it does cause additional traffic, but, you know, as a community, we have to look at the future and kind of the needs of our. Community members and, um, you know, my hope is that this would really add. Um, um, or at least alleviate some of some of that housing pressure that we, we spent 2 hours talking about. 
I mean, this is a real issue. So, so we appreciate you engaging. And I have a request share. Um, I don't know if it can be accommodated. We've had several projects, infield projects that have come before us in the last, I want to say, year and a half to two years, uh, um, mostly on the west side, that uh, there have been no progress. And I drive by and, and I still see vacant lots. Uh, if at all possible, it would be great perhaps at the next meeting if staff could just kind of do a quick update. I don't know if it needs to be an agenda item or if other commissioners are okay I, I with that. I would... oh, so, Commissioner Zaker, I think that's an absolutely wonderful idea. And I'd actually even like want to expand on that. Uh, and this is to, to Tiffany and her staff. If you can do what commissioners, and this is like, we don't want it to be too arduous, but if you can, for any of our big sites that may have, and this is, you know, all of us as commissioners, we're all Vista with her, you know, we're not here. So if there's any sites or locations that, that have been kind of at a standstill, just let us know about it. Also, any businesses that may, that may be large and maybe, you know, unfortunately be uh, on troubled times uh, and may have like, you know, may have closed down and maybe an empty storefront. Those are things that we can hopefully bring to some of our contacts and hopefully we can get them up and running again in the future. So I think we could do that in like one of these upcoming meetings. Absolutely. I think what might make sense if it's um, amenable to the commission would be for us to just have a standing item under um, director's comments related to progress on, you know, um, key sites and uh, that can just be a standing item as far as reporting out on just areas that you might want to know about. Maybe we could do that more um, as an information item and not necessarily by the director's report. Let me think about that one a little bit more. I just want to be a little bit uh, sensitive on that one, um, but definitely can just have this as a part of the regular director's report. Yeah, and, and obviously we don't want to, we don't want to, um, you know, sensitivities and if there's anything like that, we don't, but if there's like general stuff that you yeah. think would be helpful, because we, we're all here as volunteers, we're all here to help. This is what we do. Um, I think I Absolutely. saw a hand up on my, yeah, so we're here to help. So the more that we're able to be empowered in knowing what's going on, you know, like someone like commissioner Zaker with his incredible contacts, like could be able to, 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 you know, do our best to be true leaders for the, for the city commissioner Milburn. I think I saw your hand up. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say, um, the, uh, the apartments, I think it, they were referenced in Liani's, um, uh, but, uh, apartments on Broadway between the uh, ENF, those are. Tussador. Yeah, the complete and uh, which we voted on about a year ago. Uh, and then uh, on Center Street, uh, just off a of third, um, I drove by a couple of weeks ago and they were putting stuff on the outside. It's uh, like a three story apartment complex that we voted on uh, more, a little more than a year ago. And that one was stalled for a while, but, um, but that one's almost complete. Yeah. Um, and then just a Tiffany, just to thank you and, and your staff for, for all the hard work that you do. You're doing a great job. Yeah. Our absolute pleasure. And, and yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you to staff. Yeah, you all are wonderful. Uh, any final comments before we adjourn this meeting so y'all can have dinner? Commissioner Torres? Just, just one real quickly. I want to yep. throw this out to uh, Tiffany and to you, Chair, is that I don't know if you guys uh, received an email uh, right before our meeting, actually, uh, from the city, it was a survey monkey uh, email about improving the agenda items, you know, about how they're presented. So this um, falls in line with what I was going to ask is that in light of the HE update and the great presentation by, Lel by Lelani, I was wondering um, if it would not be worthwhile uh, to include in the staff reports along with environmental review a housing uh, review analysis that talks about uh, not just the balanced communities policy and the application of that policy relative to these projects, but how does this project um, affect, you know, how, how does it fit within our whole new HE update? You know, I mean, uh, with regard to housing stock, uh, the diversity of housing, how, how is that, um, uh, impact one way or another. So that way we as commissioners can get a better sense of, oh, okay, this is all making sense. For example, uh, the gentleman that talked about when I asked about the affordable housing use, that, I didn't know that that could be done, you know, but yeah, we're not, we're not doing a set aside here. It's gonna be done on, a, on, a, on the following projects under our ownership as developers and 
there's a development service agreement to that effect. I mean, if we could get th that kind of information, then uh, you wouldn't have uh, guys like me asking questions. <laughs> you know, don't make any promises you can't keep, but I will tell you. Yes. Uh, we are absolutely intending to add that section to our, our standing um, template. So Thank you're going to you. see, uh, based on what the city clerk is doing, they are doing some outreach to improve the agenda process, make it more transparent. So you're going to see some additional items that are added to the standard city council actions. We're going to mirror that with our new planning commission template as well. And we're going to add a section that is specifically for, it's going to be a housing impact analysis section. That will speak exactly to these issues and 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 really tease us out and and put a spotlight on it. So you're 100 right on our need to do that. Um, we were hoping to have that uh, tonight with this item so that we could show you some progress, but we just weren't able to make that happen. The next items that you see will have that information broken out. So you're thank you so much, Tiffany. Absolutely on the right page with that. Thank you. All right. Anything else for the do the order? Thank you, staff, and have a lovely, lovely evening, colleagues. I'll see you later. Good night, everybody.